Okay, now to uh, the main event with Jason. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, my screen just froze. Um, so, speaking uh, of the bandwidth problem. <laughs> yes. Uh, so my. Uh, um, so uh, I. Hang on. Let me just fix. It. I'm sorry about this. Know what happened here? Um, so I uh, uh, um, came across LF Edge uh, a while ago. Um, I was looking into um, you know what open source projects are out there. Uh, I first got involved with IoT almost six years ago. Um, there really wasn't much um, out there. EdgeX Foundry was one of the first ones, and. Um, you know, I wanted. It, I realized as I started looking at the projects that LF Edge had that um, things have matured quite a bit. Um, everything from the network, you know, pretty much seems to cover the entire stack. Um, and so this series was really to to look at what is going on with LF Edge. Um, I'm a big believer in open source. Uh, it, it helps us solve a lot of issues. Um, a community driven approach, from security to trying to standardize on stuff um, so it's adopted faster um, and I've been looking forward to this so um, Jason maybe we can start with uh, uh, an intro yeah uh, what do you do how did you end up here I know you're in uh, uh, you're in Austin I'm in Austin I always joke so I, this is my office slash studio and when you come to Austin they just give you a bunch of instruments it's like hey have a guitar you know need some drums go for it um, big music town, but yeah, so I've, I, uh, I've been involved in a lot of open source over the years. We'll talk about some of that. Of course, LF Edge, um, you know, I, 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 one of my mantras is, is it, if it's fuzzy, I'm on it. I really like, you know, emerging technologies and, and, you know, ambiguous stuff and helping to build markets and whatnot. So, um, been involved in a bunch of different things over the years and, and joined the need about a year ago, um, to lead our ecosystem efforts. Cool. <clears throat> Sorry, if you want to, yeah, whenever you're ready. Let me bring up my slides here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, can you see these slides? Okay, cool. Yes, yep. Okay, um, great. Yeah, so um, definitely feel free to chime in with questions. Um, and, you know, whether it's in the chat or as Hans said, you can come up on, on stage. We'll try to save some time at the end. Uh, you can always, you know, ping me off to the side. This is recorded and I, I think we can probably share the deck, you know, after the mm -hmm. fact as well. Um, if you uh, like 80s hair bands, you'll uh, get my Twitter uh, reference, uh, tw Twitter handle reference, but uh, you can also find me on, on LinkedIn. So um, as mentioned, I, I've been, um, you know, involved in a variety of different things and you know, first IoT and then the edge, uh, you know, conversation. Um, my last role, I was CTO for IoT and edge at Dell Technologies. Um, speaking of edgex, I actually, um, edgex started, I was on a drive in California, um, as I was, I'd call it the magical mystery tour, you know, going to meet different startups and, you know, who could we collaborate with and just kind of, we had the epiphany back in 2015 that no one was really, yet approaching the edge in, the, in, a, in a way that would really scale in terms of having an open foundation, but also being able to extend cloud native principles down to the edge. So I, I literally, somewhere on the road, I think it was between you know, Bay Area and uh, uh, San Jose and San Leandro, I, I called up my team back at Dell and said, hey, if I got some funding, what if we tried this? And so that was July of 2015. We launched it into open source in 17. Uh, and it's now, I think, close to 7 million downloads. And it's, I mean, it's based on just a lot of the work of a lot of great people. And um, it's just the power of open source and, and collaboration, you know, whatnot. So that's uh, uh, as, you know, related to that. That was the first project and then um, uh, helped get LF Edge bootstrapped. Um, but yeah, just been doing this for a while and uh, pretty familiar with the, with the landscape. Um, I'm going to start with just some kind of a point of view on on why I think um, you know an open edge is really important. So it's it's a bit more with you know uh, not necessarily my ZD I had on, but the you know, you know my own kind of outlook. But that sets up you know why why what we're doing as a community within LF Edge is 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 key kind of for for the realizing the true potential of of digital. Um, a lot of this stuff too. I've I've got a variety of blogs online that that you could if you want to get more on it or or whatnot. Um, 
you know, I, I talked to a lot of these themes in, in various different blogs, but, you know, probably no secret, um, you know, the, the first buzzword of, of this is you know, digital transformation, this whole nodes n mindset of continuous uh, development, continuous improvement. Um, you know, the new product mindset, as I define it, is it's the, the value of a product or service is not the day it's shipped, it's the cumulative lifetime. Uh, you know, continuously updating the product, learning from it, building um, new features, and of course, you know, IoT, all the different data that we see out there is is a big um, uh, uh, adder to this, or a boost for this. Um, and then it's also key to be part of an ecosystem. Um, whether you build one or join one, you need to be part of one going forward. Where it's, I think, it's going to be a real challenge, you know, long term. Um, the network effect is key here, and again, open source is a great way to drive that. Uh, that network effect. Uh, a couple thoughts on key tech, tech trends. So IoT and Edge, I, I like to say we're getting out of the AOL stage of IoT. You know, initially, you know, like AOL is like about connecting folks, getting devices online. Um, and, you know, Edge is now the popular conversation. IoT is a workload within Edge. But then, of course, there's a, there's a much broader uh, landscape there. And we'll talk about the continuum a bit as we go. Uh, the top two challenges with IoT, we've seen this for a long time. It has nothing to do with technology. It's, it's initially a business case. And then, you know, people, you know, the, the complex nature of different stakeholders within uh, environments, you know, a lot of people talk about OT versus IT, and then there's a line of business and different skill sets and, and um, you know, a lot of things to consider. And this is, this is uh, a lot of the reason why things have taken a while. Um, but also, there's a lot of confusion because of platform proliferation, et cetera, which is why we think that shared investment through uh, open source is uh, important. Uh, the killer app is computer vision. You know, anything, the only people that think that video uh, uh, over the wide area networks is a good idea is people selling you connectivity. Um, you want to process video locally. There's a lot of different applications. We'll talk about some of those. Um, AI in general, clearly we're seeing a lot you know, happening here. Um, you know, various degrees of true AI, of course. I mean, we're, we're not there yet, but a um, you know, big topic. Uh, <laughs> one of my uh, favorite memes, I, I can't remember who it was, but um, said that uh, uh, if it's machine learning, it's probably written in Python. If it's AI, it's probably written in PowerPoint. Um, so we've seen we've seen a lot of stuff happening. Uh, challenges in terms of what works in the lab don't necess doesn't necessarily work in the real world. Um, the need for having domain knowledge uh, applied, so it's not just about the data science; it's also about industry-specific domain knowledge. Um, I think that you know, models around very rec very common pattern recognition will become more commodity, but domain knowledge will always be uh, important. And then, of course, there's things around trust and and, and ethics and things like that. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. Um, 5G, uh, lots of new experience uh, going to be driven. It's not a, a panacea for um, uh, solutions, um, but certainly there's a lot of, uh, of, of great stuff that we're going to see. Um, contrary to some folks' understanding is, you know, 5G creates a super fast pipe locally, but you still have that upstream challenge. So it actually drives more uh, edge compute. Some folks are like, oh, if you've got a really fast network, then then you can do everything in the cloud. But um, it does create a, a localized uh, um, you know, fast pipe. So, so we're going to see some really good trends there. And and also, I believe with five G, um, you know, more and more conversations around private five G is we're going to see new types of business models spin up over there. And in, uh, in that regard, and not necessarily from traditional uh, telco players. Um, you know, we're already seeing you know industrial players starting to offer five G working with telco players because you know they, they understand their their unique parts of the solution. Um, so just it's going to change how things uh, are. Um, you know, people are approaching various different elements of of the stack. So um, you know, one of the things you know, obviously I'm, I'm I'm big into ecosystem. Uh, your know, first step is to decide what's your approach, and you know I think. The old way of doing ecosystems was like, let me build a product and then I'll figure out who I can partner with to go sell it or go to market with. The right way to do it is to build the ecosystem into the product. And and either way you take, whether it's a more open approach or a more closed approach, and there's benefits to both, but clearly, you know, there's value from a scale standpoint, from an open approach. Um, you know, Android's got over 80% of the, the market share, but of course, then Apple can create, you know, a unique experience um, within it. So there's there's always trade-offs, but, you know, the key here is uh, you need to build it into the, to the product. Um, the benefit of starting with open, of course, is then you can choose, you can do that shared technology investment. You can choose when you go to market 
you know, what degree of openness versus uh, more closed that you want to take. So it just gives you the most flexibility. Um, plus, you don't have to go build everything out on your own. It's a huge lift if you want to build a proprietary um, stack. Uh, I like this story. It just kind of explains a bit more about, you know, how business uh, things kind of uh, reach a natural equilibrium, uh, equilibrium in business. Um, so Phil and Fred. So uh, Fred was, this was a, an implementation we did a number of years back at uh, POC at this um, uh, farm that grew microgreens in, in a um, greenhouse. And, you know, fr uh, Fred was the farmer. And if, if it got free, you know, to freezing temperatures, he'd lose like $5,000 of a crop overnight. And so he was like worried that if the protein, propane tank that heated these uh, uh, greenhouses ran empty, then he's going to lose, you know, all that money. And then Phil's the propane guy that like, he'd like to go uh, out to fill it up when it's bone dry, um, because then he make, maximizes his trip charge. And so we instrumented that tank with um, a sensor and that would tell both both of them exactly how much propane was in that tank and and when we did that now phil's uh, fr uh, uh you know loving watching it go to zero and fred's freaking out if it's you know not 100 percent full and they found that if it's 40 percent full on average you know everybody's happy and this is kind of an example of the the people part and this is you know kind of a simple one in terms of just a a, a direct business relationship and but we're going to see more and more of this happen over time and the real potential longer term is when all these different use cases start to, to, to really connect. So, so today, you know, we're getting out of ALS stage of IoT. I would you know, say it's really more of a series of intranets of things. And then we're going to see those increasingly connect. Um, and, and as these connect, we're going to drive entirely new experiences, new business models, et cetera. And so the real value is you know, any combination of, you know, uh, whether it's B to B to B, uh, B to C, B to B to C, you know, any, any kind of combination of business models, there's massive potential, you know, going forward. But to get to this, you can't have one company own the trust. You know, imagine if, if one company or a few companies own the internet outright. Um, you have to, sh to, to, to distribute the trust. Uh, in consumer, you tend to have brands that build up trust with, uh, consumers and if you build if you build trust with someone and you provide them with value then generally they'll give up some privacy you know to find that balance it, it's part of it but in the in the broader sense of the the the, the world you, you can't have um, you know single companies or organizations owning that trust so so how do you disaggregate it you know is, is a big question and, and a lot of it's about relationships but then also how can they have technology you know help help shape that so I always joke, um, you know, just put some blockchain on it, right? You know, that'll solve all your problems. And and um, the uh, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Big Fat Greek Wedding, the dad sprays Windex and everything. So I, I joke that, I mean, blockchain, distributed ledger, very important technology as, as a bunch of technologies. But um, I joke that they're, they're Windexes of technology. So if you've seen um, my Big Fat Greek Wedding, the, the dad sprays Windex and everything. It's like, oh, you got you to gotta cut and you put some Windex on it. Um, very important, but we also have to look at them realistically. And and trust requires a a solution level approach, a system level approach, you know, in, in a holistic fashion. And, and we'll touch a little bit more on that. So and also, you know, with so much data originating at the edge, you know, driven by IoT or otherwise, uh, you you need that open foundation to build trust. Long term. Leading solution providers, you know, businesses, um, you know, etc. The winners will be the ones that have domain knowledge first and foremost, offering necessarily unique hardware, software, services on top of open, you know, consistent infrastructure. I mean, it's it's, you know, same same way the internet, you know, got you know built. Um, you know, uh, uh, open source. It's the modern way to drive standards. It used to be like, let's go, you know develop some specs and you know create a standard and then we try to get adoption and this that, and the other and open source is great because you can run code and and it iterate really fast as part of a broader community and uh, a term i like to use for open source is it helps you avoid undifferentiated heavy lifting and there's a lot of people that still think that they've got to own all parts of the solution and they're kind of missing the point in terms of how you build that network effect across um your various different uh, parts of a, a, an ecosystem, and how do you get to that ultimate potential over time? So, so LF Edge, uh, and I'll, I'm going to get into a lot more detail on LF Edge, but you know, there's some key considerations when you look to go build out these types of solutions. And, and first and foremost, 
uh, and these these are the principles that that all the projects within LF Edge are, are um, kind of adhering to. First and foremost, you know, the, the data is the last thing that the ultimate thing that we want to virtualize. You, you, the values in the data, actually trusted data, is is you know the most important thing. But in any event, you you want to abstract data applications and domain knowledge from underlying infrastructure. You know, when's the last time your ERP system or your CRM system managed your PCs? You know, you just don't do that. What we've seen in IoT to date is so many IoT platforms that do a little bit of everything, um, but they they don't necessarily do one thing really well. And so what we're going to start to see, and what we're already seeing in the market, is there's there's more and more folks that are building pure play offers that that kind of work across um, you know various different use cases that attach together, and these open uh, frameworks can help bridge those those offers uh, versus kind of the the platforms that do a little bit of everything. Um, the, the next, you know, I think key element is making sure that you decouple any edge source from any given backend, whether it's cloud or otherwise, as close as possible to the source of the data. Um, and so this is a reason, you know, for EdgeX Foundry, you know, Fledge with an LF Edge, you know, um, you know, how do I, how do I decouple that? Because if you decouple data from any given you know, backend, the moment it's created, now all permutations from edge to cloud works. And it's nothing against clouds. The, the, the cloud is super important. In fact, I would say that you know, edge computing you know, is, is not really edge computing without some semblance of, of you know, a comprehensive cloud and, and working together with the cloud. But it's important to create that decoupling point. And the last one, you know, of course, cloud native principles, loosely coupled architectures, platform independence, continuous delivery. Um, you know, we're seeing more of those principles. We want to extend those you know, closer and closer to the edge. Um, you know, there's also though trade-offs in terms of constrained hardware. Uh, time critical applications. If you go talk about continuous delivery to somebody in the operations world, they'll probably look at you kind of funny, but um, things will change over time. And if you architect properly today, as you know, risk profiles change, as cultures evolve, you can start to adapt uh, um, you know, as, as uh, you kind of run through that build and learn process. So um, you really important considerations, we think, uh, over time. And of course, that plugs into um, uh, LF Edge. Uh, another thing, I, I talk with data data folks a lot of the times, and they're like, "Well, I don't, I don't care where my data comes from. I just want you know clean metadata, and I'm happy I can analyze it." And like, well, you can't extract value from data that you don't know where it's been. And so, trusted data matters, and if data is originating to the edge, of course, it, it it's important. So, um, a couple different reasons you need you need trust. So, one is around this notion of data confidence spanning you know. Um, you know, heterogeneous networks. Uh, there's some concepts that I've worked on with a variety of folks in the industry around trust fabrics, um, this this notion of driving data confidence. And, and so that's going to be, I think, a, a, a big trend over the next five years. Um, you know, how do you maintain privacy? So finding that balance between privacy and value, how do you identify fake data, um, you know, maintain compliance? And the other one, too, that's very interesting at the edge is, you know, a lot of people talk about workload consolidation. I, I can take common infrastructure and then run applications from different stakeholders on that same infrastructure. But getting back to the people part, if you, there's not trust in that infrastructure, then people will be like, oh, I'm not going to run my application on that person's app. You know, I don't trust the OT group or I don't trust that person or, hey, that third party supplier I don't trust. But what's funny is in the cloud, a lot of times you wouldn't necessarily know that your workloads are running next to whoever because it's out of sight, out of mind. When you get into the physical world, psychology kicks in. And so this is another reason you need trust. And, and again, another reason why open matters. So IoT drove more and more data. That's kind of like the connect era. You know, we're getting things online. Um, that's, of course, continuing. Um, edge computing, you know, now that there's so much data for reasons of autonomy, privacy, bandwidth, uh, you know, all of the above, we need edge computing. Uh, doesn't mean the cloud's going away. We're just going to see more compute in distributed fashion. And then, you know, this notion of trust fabrics and interconnected ecosystems is, is um, you know, I think, you know, kind of the next big wave and, and open is a very, very key part of that. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, definitely feel free to pop in with any questions. I'll, I'll just kind of run through and then we'll have some time at the end. So so that's kind of like the setup, you know, why, why I think, you know, it's really important to think about how you architect, you know, how you build for scale and, and grow into, into new uh, different, you know, you know, delivering new experiences, whether you're a developer or an organization. So now let's kind of turn to LF Edge. Um, you know, LF Edge is an umbrella organization within um, the Linux Foundation, uh, set up very similarly to CNCF, you know, Cloud Native Compute, where Kubernetes uh, came out of. 
uh, the, they have, there's a networking umbrella. And the whole idea is to bring together uh, uh, complementary projects that, you know, over time you seek to harmonize between these projects that are, you know, valuable independently, but better together. And you know, be welcoming this community, but create structure, you know, do it in a very open fashion, um, you know, with vendor neutral governance, just like any Linux foundation project. And so that's been the, um, uh, uh, that's the you know core focus of LF Edge. It was started about a year and a half ago, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the projects. But you know, first, you know, let's let's define the edge. And there's a really good white paper that um, uh, we wrote as a community last June. You can find it online if you search for LF Edge taxonomy, um, and it, it gets into kind of what are the different edges, so to speak, which certainly relate back to IoT and a number of other use cases. And one of the challenges in edge right now is there's a lot of edge washing and, and confusion over terms. And, and so taxonomies matter as much as uh, you know, to help people get on the same page. So this is a view. I won't go into all the details just for time. But uh, again, check out the white paper um, if you're interested. But, you know, the way we define the edge here and, and you know, the old standards joke is how do you, you know, fix a standards problem? You come up with one new standard. So in this case, how do you fix a taxonomy problem? We'll come up with a new one. But we've, we've, we, it's really resonated with a, a number of folks because instead of ambiguous terms like thin and thick and near and far, we, use, we, look, we looked at it as a way of like, what are inherent technical trade-offs? Am I on a wide area network relative to the uh, uh, the devices that are attaching to me? Or am I on a local area network? If you're on a wide area network, you will never do latency critical use cases like your airbag. Uh, latency sensitive, yes, you know, great benefit to centralizing you know, resources that are sensitive with latency and, you know, and a 5G you know, network can help with that because um, you, you can scale out over lots of different users, but uh, latency critical, very different. Are you in a physically secure data center or are you in a, an accessible area? So this is where, where um, you know, physical and network perimeters you know, uh, start to disappear. So, so that breaking point. Are you able to run um, workload abstraction, whether it's containers, VMs, you know, build Kubernetes clusters, you name it, or are you so constrained that you have to go embedded? So these are the types of trade-offs that, that we built into the white paper, uh, you know, into this taxonomy that's outlined in the white paper in, in great detail. And um, it really kind of helps to, you know, delineate between where you're focusing. And then of course, LF Edge focuses across the, the, the spectrum. Um, so the, the white paper has a variety of different use cases it talks to, you know, the key point here is it's not like everything flows through that continuum, you know, uh, you know, in a serial fashion, you're going to have constrained devices talking directly to cloud services, you know, um, you know, consumer devices talking to service provider edge, you know, it could be drones, you name it, uh, or layered industrial networks that have gateways and then on-prem you know, servers and whatnot. So you're going to see a lot of different permutations but the key is architecting across the continuum, and again, with cloud native as many places as possible, so you have options, but then also recognize the trade-offs between different you know, technical constraints, you know, and, and even some of the culture things that you see out there between you know, OT and IT and, and otherwise. So uh, it's all about architecting uh, for, for long-term growth uh, while also you know, kind of planning for an evolution over time. So a lot of a lot of different use cases we're seeing. So edge, of course, is not just IoT. Um, certainly, lots of cool things going to be driven by five G around AR and, and you know, things in automotive. Um, lots of cool experiences in retail. Um, you know, and, and of course, industrial. Uh, it won't get into all the use cases in, in uh, today. Just out of interest of time, but you know, like I mentioned, anything involving video is key. Uh, anything involving um, uh, uh, you know, like say it's a high bandwidth vibration data, uh, you know, very, very um, uh, rich amounts of data to look for, you know, anomalies in the machine, uh, you know, prime candidates for, for vibration. Uh, there's other things like tiny ML where you're doing it from a privacy standpoint or, or you know, also data filtering. So a variety of different use cases you know, out there. So, so kind of clicking down a bit into LF Edge. Um, you know, as I mentioned, LF Edge is really about trying to bring together open source projects, build a, a, a community um, that kind of harmonizes across various different markets. Uh, you know, we, we try to not play favorites on silicon types, you know, clouds, um, you know, uh, protocols, connectivity protocols, um, you know, the hardware types. You know, we want to be, you know, create frameworks that are super flexible, uh, bringing a variety of different elements together. 
Um, and then also it's, it's important to collaborate with other consortiums. Um, and I know the Clips Foundation had, had pitched uh, recently in, in the meetup and, and we're also looking at ways, you know, can we collaborate with, with the Clips? We think it's you know, just important. We all win if, if we start to kind of build these open foundations. And, um, you know, I think in this market, you win by, you win by merit, not, not lock in, you know, going forward. Um, and I mentioned that it's, you know, it's very similar to some of the other Linux Foundation, you know, projects. Um, so, so the continuum, here's that, that taxonomy that, uh, I was talking about and you've got the various different projects. There's nine total projects, uh, today. This is actually missing one, this, this slide, a uh, uh, secure device on board. Um, and they each have kind of a different focus area. So, uh, and, and there's some overlap between projects today, but that's kind of the point too, is like bring, bring things in, drive communities. And then the way, the best way to vote in open source is, you know, with your keyboard, you know, code. And, and build the community um, around that. So, uh, you know, kind of quick overview. There's some detailed slides. I'll, I'll touch on some of the details, but you know, and just in the interest of time, um, we won't go through all of the details. Plus, as as Hans mentioned, uh, as part of a broader series, you'll you'll hear from some of the different projects and, and get a lot more you know, detail on the projects. But um, you know, Crano as one of the founding projects that's a little bit different than the others because you know, it's more uh, there's there's code involved in apis but it's also about building blueprints you know starting kind of on the telco side of things on the the, the service provider edge as we call it um but also extending down uh, closer to the the user edge and the devices you know in the field um but but how do i create blueprints around best in class architectures, you know, deployment models, um, you know, reference examples and things like that. So that's the, the focus of a crano. Uh, uh, you know, as mentioned, EdgeX was another uh, founding project. Um, that's that's on the application side. So on the bottom, it's more infrastructure and the top is more application frameworks. None of these projects are trying to define and applications, it's really more about application enablement. You take these tools, then you go build you know, applications with your choice of, of, of ingredients. Um, you know, very readily, can you, you can build applications, but it's not trying to compete with you know, that value add with the domain expertise on top. Um, so EdgeX is all about an interoperability play between all of the fragmented protocols out there and, and your choice of applications. Um, EdgeX was architected with a very, very modular architecture and everything, all these microservices. So it's bu you know, built to extend cloud native um, you know, principles to the edge. Uh, you know, obviously it's a playoff of Cloud Foundry. The X enables it to be trademarked. So that could be a certification mark. But um, that that project is architected for maximum flexibility. You you have some trade-offs for performance, you know, in terms of you know the different modularity, but you get the benefit of of highly flexible um, you know uh, plugins. Those APIs help you drive an ecosystem. So there's inherent you know trade-offs, but there's a lot of value to be gained uh, from that. Um, you know, on the other hand, Fledge is another project within the the, the community. Um, Fledge. You know, on, on service level, it looks oh, they're overlapped because you know they're both about IoT frameworks, and there is some overlap, but there's there's a slightly different focus. Fledge is is optimized a bit more for constrained devices. Um, it's optimized more for you know uh, high bandwidth data ingestion, but at the same time, you trade off some of that uh, modularity, you know, so, uh, you know, it's just inherent, you know, technical trade-offs and they're actually working together on how could there be bridges between Fledge and EdgeX Foundry, like, you know, Fledge could feed EdgeX Foundry or vice versa and, and you know, what does that look like over time? So, um, you know, going down the line, so Home Edge stage one project that was contributed by Samsung. And, and that's that's really about how do I wrap up services around home use cases? Could be surveillance uh, you know, in the home, it could be voice services, things like that, you know, leveraging AI, et cetera. And they're actually collaborating with EdgeX and some of the other projects. Um, Betel is, um, was contributed by Baidu. That's, that's extending cloud services down to um, you know, on-prem edges and, and getting involved with AI and things like that. Um, project Eve, this is a project that Zadita contributed, um, but you know, now it's you know, uh, probably roughly 60 develop or, you know, unique contributors, developers, and, and um, you know, so it's been growing. That, that's an infrastructure play. Uh, you know, Eve OS, is, as uh, driven by Project Eve, is about how do I create a kind of a universal Linux-based operating system for edge computing um, that supports not only containers and, and Kubernetes clusters, but also virtual machines for legacy apps and you know, additional security functions, et cetera. 
um, open right. And you'll hear more about that if you join in tomorrow. Roman and Aaron, as Hans mentioned, will be talking about it. Uh, open Horizon is also about orchestration uh, that was contributed by I IBM. Um, it, it's about delivering containers out to distributed assets. Uh, it's it's a compared to Eve, it's it's an agent based solution. And there's actually a scenario where Open Horizon and Eve Eve could be a substrate for an Open Horizon deployment. And um, so, you know, despite again there being some overlap, there's there's certainly opportunities. And we've been chatting about how uh, how we might be able to kind of collaborate and and uh, provide a better together story over time. So that's that's kind of the projects. Oh, the last one, sorry, that, that's missing on this slide is is secure device on board. It came in over the summer. That was contributed by by Intel. Um, SDO is is all about um, how do I enable a, a chain of trust within um, a channel. So so this whole notion of zero touch provisioning. Um, I want to be able to ship a device from a factory and then through a channel, you know, make sure that I've uh, I understand the prominence of that device. So when an end user attaches it uh, to a network and it gets bootstrapped. Uh, I can close the loop uh, in terms of the certificates and, and whatnot. Um, you can certainly short circuit that at the tail end today, but um, secure device onboard is how do I go do that as part of a broader interoperab interoperability play in, in an ecosystem. So the FIDO um, uh, organization, standards organization recently adopted that as a, uh, a standard and, and from an open source standpoint, uh, secure device onboard is a good way to drive uh, consensus around that code. It's only ultimately, um, valuable if, if you have critical mass of adoption and, and we see that as, this is a good way to drive it so um so that's kind of an overview of all the projects um you've got got summaries within these um within the slides that uh that will be sent out um and then um uh, and, and a lot of this stuff is available online if you go to the lf site um you know as mentioned it's important to be collaborating across different um uh, ecosystems and and uh, we're, we're also collaborating with various consortia like industrial internet con uh, consortium and stuff like that um, all kinds of different use cases that are enabled by the projects um, and I mentioned a number of these but whether it's you know uh, pure industrial could be anything revolving around uh, broader IOT use cases and then of course a, a full complement of telco use cases um, the community is growing uh, we did our survey late last year and I'll, I'll wrap up here in a couple of minutes um, uh, a survey late last year, and and you know we actually found that a lot of people enjoyed working in Alpha Edge, not just because it's you know about collaboration with with folks, but also um, it's it's almost like an informal ecosystem program, you know, creating new markets, trying to uh, influence the industry, deriving new business and whatnot. Were some of the biggest reasons people joined Alpha Edge. Uh, and seeing you know great member increase, you know project contributions you know, over time. And um, you know we just continue to grow as a community. There's an interactive landscape uh, that's uh, uh, available out there. Uh, talks about various different companies. You can actually get your company listed if interested. I didn't mention so the state of the edge project is is more uh, also kind of like a crane a little bit different than the others, but it's about how do we drive glossary definitions, doing this interactive landscape, uh, helping align people across different terminology, which is always important to reduce confusion in the market. Um, so a lot of different companies uh, um, uh, um, joining the project, you know, like any at Linux Foundation project, you do not need to be a member of the project, a paid member of the project to join uh, or to join in on con uh, contributions. It's really, um, that's a, it's a technical meritocracy from that standpoint. And then there's stages for the projects based on, you know, as they come in, they start at stage one and as they grow and, and become more mature, um, they raise up through stages. Um, and uh, you know that's kind of how it plays out. Uh, general members, and then of course we've got you know, liaisons with very different, various different industry consortia. Uh, variety of links here. All this stuff again can be found online through the LFED site. Um, you're welcome to check it out, dive in. Um, you know this this last slide is a couple different steps you can take. You know, join any of the the individual technical steering committee meetings for any of the projects. Uh, you can join in um, you know, on the technical advisory channel. That's the broader umbrella technical steering committee. Uh, just dive in, go to GitHub, download code, and go to town. You know, it's another way to, to get involved. So lots of different opportunities if you'd like to, to, to participate. So with that, I know we've got another you know, five minutes or so. You know, ask if there's any, any questions or you know, I know there's yep. rapid fire, but you know, glad to answer any questions or you know, reach out afterwards. Yeah, we have a, a question from Gil. 
Um, that was awesome. I, and I'm, I'm happy to hear about uh, collaborating with Eclipse. I mean, there's too many problems that need to be solved and uh, um, some of them are pretty hard. So yeah, yeah, I know. That's collaborate. Okay, yep. I'm gonna invite uh, Gil. Go ahead, Gil. You there? Gil? Oh, there you are. All right. <laughs> no worries. About that, I got two versions of mute here that I got to hit at the same time. Oh, yeah. You guys talked about trust. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, it was a great presentation. You talked about trust being important, right? Because the data integrity. But one of the things I've dealt with in the edge world is synchronizing time, right? We have all these data sources yeah. that came. And you know, the example I always use, right? Did the vibration from the machine come before or after the current suddenly went you know, out of control? Yeah. And we don't need millisecond or microsecond time, but you know, every clock on every computer is pretty messed up. How do we make everybody uh, so we can sort it out on the back end? Yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the, the reason why, you know, it's, it's related to needing standards, especially when you've got heterogeneous environments. Um, you know, I think uh, there's also things around uh, time sensitive networking. So this is foundational stuff. So TSN has been really picking up, you know, folks building those capabilities, the underlying capabilities into silicon. Um, of course, so there's there's time sensitive network networking, and then of course there's the application stacks on top. And you know, uh, historians have been around for a long time in terms of bringing data in, uh, cleansing, aligning data to um, you know a, a time uh, sync. But at the same time, the classic historian has been built to really more about data reporting, but not necessarily for analytics. So we're seeing a trend where the new breed of historian is kind of built with AI in mind, but still needs to have that uh, uh, um, alignment function. So yeah, I mean, I, that's definitely a challenge. Um, I think, you know, in addition to just like purely protocol interoperability, data contextualization is a big one. Uh, how do you apply the right metadata and, you know, have people make sense of it on top? That's actually one of the big challenges with, with any kind of analytics is just getting clean data with the right metadata that you can make sense of it. But yeah, it's a challenging problem and we see some some different trends, um, but that's definitely one that's going to require some collaboration just because things are heterogeneous. Yeah, and unfortunately with our internet 1.0 where all these delays and you know you have no idea when packets came in and it seems like TSN has been in this standstill for the last three years and it seems like it's always that standard that's coming any day now but never comes and everybody's sitting on their heels. So that's that's a problem for us trying to implement things today. Yeah, and it also depends on where you're going to run the analytics. This is another reason to run it locally versus trying to coordinate that over a wider network um, and then send results up. But yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, there's you know, TSN's been um, slowly evolving. Uh, OPC UA as a, in, as a, a more open protocol uh, has actually been accelerating a bit in the recent years, but that's taken a while to come around. And yeah, it's going to be an ongoing challenge, but definitely an important one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gil. Yeah. So, so Gil's company designs. Uh, one of the things they do is they de design and build uh, some pretty big robots. Uh, like uh, we had, we had um, them at one of our meetups, and uh, they talked about how they built a, a massive robot to lay out the skin on a seven eight seven's wing. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, it's cool. Awesome. Thank you, Gil. Uh, okay, I have one other raised hand. Okay. Go ahead, Laurie. How are you doing? Oh, you disappeared. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's late for Laurie. I think he's in the UK. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> um, 
So I, I had a question, you know, so I was poking around in the, uh, um, uh, on the wiki, on the LF Edge wiki, and it, and it looked like um, there's an initiative to start um, focusing on, on kind of industries. Like, for example, I saw manufacturing, but there wasn't a lot of activity there. Um, yeah. What's the yeah, idea that with that? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so that's emerging. Uh, I've actually been working with a, a committee on that. And um, this this notion of vertical solution working group, similar to what, what's been done in uh, CNCF and others, uh, we're spinning up. And actually, we, we just finalized the way members can join of end user companies, you know, consumers of, of code that can drive requirements back into the project. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we're making it to where there's no member fee to join in that category because it's so important as, as you all could I'm sure appreciate to get you know, feedback from actual uh, mm -hmm. you know, users or consumers of code versus having, you know, creating a bunch of solutions looking for problems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, stay tuned on that. You'll see uh, more, more detail uh, over the next uh, uh, few months on yeah. you know, how to get involved and, and that'll shape up more on the project. Um, actually, I saw um, Henry uh, Lau from HP uh, recently or on the, on the, I don't know if he's still here, but, um, He's been very, very involved with EdgeX and, and looking to drive one. Uh, they're looking to drive one around retail, and, and we're going to mm -hmm. see more and more projects you kind of spin up uh, around that or efforts spin up around that. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I, I, I'll send you what we're trying to do with the uh, the meetup on manufacturing. Discrete. Yeah, it'd uh, be great to tie that together. Yeah. Um, all right. Like uh, Laurie, Laurie. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Laurie. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Hi, Hans. Can you hear me this time? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Johnny, good. Yeah, I was just you cut me off from my prime a moment ago, but uh, I was just <laughs> just trying to get myself organised. Yeah, Jason, hi, good to meet you. Fantastic uh, talk this evening. Thank you. Uh, very well worth staying up, uh, even though it's been a long day for all of us, I'm sure. Um, now, I just wanted to take you back to your comment about metadata standards, uh, metadata semantics, as I would call it, and ask you which of the LF Edge uh, groups or projects would you recommend? Um, I follow up on because I'm particularly interested in uh, developing more uh, structure and standards in that uh, in that area. Obviously, in my case, related to the water sector, which is a perfect application for decentralized edge computing. Um, but we've got all these legacy systems out there, and we need a, a, a framework to be able to couple up the legacy devices with the, um, the, the, the new devices and applications which we're developing. So which of the LF Edge projects is, is most aligned to the yeah. semantics side, please? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's definitely getting more into the kind of the data side of things, the application mm -hmm. layer. Um, the the most relevant projects would be EdgeX Foundry and Fledge. Okay. Um, both projects uh, are are effectively double translation engines. So you take <clears throat> whatever southbound uh, protocol that you want to speak, and then that translated translates it into uh, you know any northbound protocol. And, and uh, you know of course there's very specific protocols for industrial systems. You know, you've got all kinds of different things: BACnet, Modbus, you know Zigbee, BLE, whatever on the south side. North side could be MQTT, could be REST protocols, whatever. Yeah. Um, but that's the base protocol. And then, of course, there's the data models associated with it. I will say, uh, and, and both projects uh, are flexible as to what data model you can apply on top. But if you pick one data model as the core, you're going to be wrong to a lot of people because it always breaks down with data model and whatnot. And you know, every industry has kind of got their own semantics. And we'll see some, some stuff happen over time. But when we actually developed EdgeX early on, we perf purposely made it completely flat in the middle because if you picked one, we had different people say, oh, you should use my model, you should use my model. And we're like, no, 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 we're gonna be Switzerland and just pick you know this flat model and then you can make it whatever you want on top, you know, whether it's for a specific industry or otherwise. And so, so those projects would be the best ones to engage with and, and look at how you could bridge you know, the semantics that matter to, to your industry, you know, to the, the projects. So I'm interested in something like LWM2M as a, as a, yeah. as a, as a base model. And then add on top of that industry specific uh, right. vocabularies, dictionaries that um, enable you to do the translation for a specific application. So LWM2M is one of the technologies, is it one of the standards that would, would appear somewhere within the LF Edge yeah. community? Yeah, we, yeah, so EdgeX, for example, looked at lightweight uh, M to M as a, a way from a, from a management protocol. Um, but then the challenge is if you make that the standard, then you're wrong to other people. 
So yeah. the way they, the way they, uh, even though it's quite popular, the way that it was done is, is there's a, um, there's the data part and then there's the management side in terms of you know, man managing the applications within. And those were done. Um, there's a, again, Switzerland, um, microservice that uh, bridges to the APIs within the project. And then that microservice can talk to whatever you want. And that could be a lightweight M to M agent. So again, it's creating that bridge. But the nice thing about that is that you've, you've made a universal bridge back. So you can, you, you have inter interoperability with other types of approaches. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely okay. one that, you know, engage with the communities on and, and mm -hmm. see how you can kind of map to the, to the technologies that you want to use. Fantastic. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Laurie. Yeah, Laurie is working on an interesting project, and uh, we we talked uh, talked uh, about well, the importance of uh, uh, open source because he he got locked in. <laughs> yeah, uh, with his the, product. Right? So indeed. yeah, I'll come and yeah. tell you about it in a, in a in a couple of months' time, Hans. If you'd like to put me onto the yeah. schedule, uh, yeah, as, as we discussed. So if you yeah. can sort of set me up for a March time, then I'd be yeah. happy to come along, not only to to tell about, but also to uh, sort of seek. Uh, inspiration and ideas from your mm -hmm. worthy audience as well so yep. it's a great it's yeah. a great great networking event great hub event thank you i joke, I joke that there's a I joke that there's a lot of platform players that are trying to sell you iot gateway drugs to get you hooked and then you're locked in <laughs> <laughs> well i started my life out on thingworks uh, many many years ago so uh, it goes back to uh, meeting with rick Bellotta and, uh, and and being yeah. Yeah. Uh, blown away by what they were doing in the good old days before oh, anyway I'll, i won't say anymore yeah, cool. yeah. um yeah and actually ajax makes me think just so you know like there there was there's been a project i think associated with water treatment facilities just just uh so you know but um yeah Has cool. okay well, in that case i'll definitely look that up if you, if you can send me the link or send it through hands that i'd be particularly grateful thank you because i'm always looking for those kind of hooks to uh, to latch on to I think your point about ecosystems, by the way, at the very beginning was absolutely excellent. Um, but the trouble is these days there's so many ecosystems now emerging. It's very difficult to uh, for a small business, especially a startup, to decide which ecosystem is going to run run the course. Um, yeah. Maybe it's necessary to switch ecosystems at different points of the development curve. Um, yeah. But that's the benefit. That's the benefit of attaching to open frameworks sure. that become the hub to the various different spokes. Yep. Um, so you don't get knee jerk, you know, knee jerked around, especially if you've got limited resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's very true. All right. Thank you, Laurie, and thanks for staying up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right. I think that, that was quest That was the uh, end of the questions. Um, Jason, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. If you have time, you're welcome to hang out. Uh, I'm going to hang out and uh, go into the uh, lounge. And um, So for everyone else, uh, once I end this session, it will take you back to the lounge area uh, where you'll see five tables. Um, and uh, you basically just click on join and uh, uh, turn on your camera and um, you'll be in a, a small Zoom call. And uh, I guess I will see you over there. In the meantime, Jason, thank you so much. This is awesome. I am, I'm, really, I'm really glad. And, and I think, uh, you know, like I said to um, uh, Jason when I first spoke with him, the taxonomy itself um, uh, really is a godsend because everyone has their own terminology, <laughs> uh, you know, especially with Edge, right? It's so new and you expect that. Right? It's, it's fairly new, but uh, we need a standard way to start describing these things. and. Uh, the uh, uh, taxonomy that uh, Jason helped put together is, is awesome. And I posted a link in the chat window to the PDF, um, but uh, you should go check it out. Um, otherwise, thank you, folks. Uh, I will uh, see you in the lounge and again tomorrow at, uh, um, I think it's four o'clock as well, with uh, Roman and Aaron talking about Project Team. Um, and then in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll start bringing in the other projects as well as, uh, as schedules start lining up. So uh, thank you guys. Thank you, Jason. I'll see you in the lounge. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.